Hi, my name is Daryl Rogers. I'll be your host for the Voices of Truth webcast. Today I'll be talking with addiction psychiatrist, Dr. Libby Stout, and our topic is coping through quarantine. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about, about your background. Well, I am an addiction psychiatrist, so I've been working with people with addiction problems for the past 30 years. Uh, and I've been running a treatment program in Colorado that's uh, pretty phenomenal. It's a 90-day inpatient program for people with dual diagnosis, so people that have mental health issues and uh, substance use disorder issues. Uh, and it's funded by the state of Colorado. So it's, it's really for people who have failed everything else. So we see the people that have tried everything and can't seem to stop using. And we have really good outcomes. And uh, for most of those 20 years, it was at the state hospital. And that's where I uh, was doing, doing the program. But then they closed the program because they needed more staff and they would closed my program to take my staff. And there was such an uproar from the community, you know, the state that uh, the legislature agreed to keep it going. Um, but it's in the community now. So it's in a community treatment program, but the legislature has agreed to fund two more programs. Uh, and so there's two other programs coming up similar to what we do. And it's a very intense cognitive behavioral treatment program that's pretty much abstinence based and uh, including tobacco. But that's very important. People need to quit everything at the same time, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and they have really good outcomes. And I'm actually looking at retiring from that. Uh, the other thing I do is I work uh, part time as a consultant in the community community health center here. So it's a federally qualified, fully integrated community health center for the, you know, the low income people, the people on Medicaid. And it's a pretty wonderful organization and they provide medical care, dental care, and then behavioral health care to people. And so I work one half day a week there doing you know, psychiatric stuff. And that's where I've seen most of the issues with cannabis. I mean, I've always seen cannabis in treatment, you know, in my treatment facility, because people have always used that as kind of a companion drug and, uh, you know, trying to help people figure out how to quit doing that. Mm -hmm. But in the community health centers where I see so many people using it as a medicine, and um, so my job there is they, they have all these primary care docs who, you know, diagnose people with their mental health issues and prescribe medication. And they have behavioral health people that do therapy with them, family therapy, individual therapy, group therapy. And so I get to refer to the people that have failed all that. <laughs> and invariably what I'm seeing are people using high potency marijuana and so I have to try and convince them that their problems are because of the marijuana they're using. Mm -hmm. It's a really hard sell. I mean, a lot of people really do believe that, you know, it's what they're, they should be on because it's medicine. I think we've done a real disservice to people by giving the message that it's wonderful stuff, um, safe, green, has no consequences. Uh, and, and so I have to convince people and it's a hard sell, but I've been successful in getting several people to actually quit. And it's very difficult to quit because the higher the potency of the drug makes it more addicting. And so it's very difficult. And I've, for my entire career, focused on tobacco. That's been the thing I really was pushing that people need to quit. Um, and that's the hardest one to quit is nicotine. Mm -hmm. We're now starting to see a similar thing with cannabis, um, that it's really hard to quit for people that are addicted. Yeah. And so that's what um, I spend almost all of my time doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I hear that from people, you know, it takes them a while to get to that point. Usually they want to admit that they, um, that cannabis is a problem or that it's addictive. Really, you know, this is, um, 
this is sort of a, a, a obviously a different time that we're dealing with here. A lot of uh, unique um, uh, situations and, and people are inside and, and there are a lot of stresses that uh, people are under that they wouldn't normally be under. Um, loss of jobs, um, you know, how are they going to pay the bills, all the uncertainty around it, things like that. Um, and um, so it's, it's creating a lot of anxiety for people. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, maybe increasing use of substances uh, to cope with that anxiety uh, for people who are already users or maybe people who are not users yet, but they're sort of on the teetering there, you know, on the, on the border or on the fence. So, um, and then my first question was, you know, how have um, coronavirus safety measures impacted marijuana users, uh, people in recovery or people who may be tempted to use for the first time from your, from your viewpoint? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I, what we do know from research is that substance abuse increases in times of stress and when people are feeling you know, out of control. Uh, and that is something people go to, um, whether it's alcohol, marijuana, tobacco, other drugs. And so it, for people who are attempting to be in recovery, this is a high stress time. Um, and so they need to kind of figure out how they can continue working on what they're working on to stay sober. Uh, for people that have never gotten into it before, I think it is tempting because, you know, like in Colorado, at least, uh, they've made uh, medical marijuana stores essential. And right. so they're as just as essential as pharmacies or food stores which I have issues with um, primarily because we're not talking about the marijuana of the olden times and we're not talking about the marijuana uh, that was done in research that showed benefits. Um, most of the products that are available in the dispensaries now, even the medical ones, are all the really high potency THC products. So the high potency plants and and the concentrates. Um, and so that makes them much more addicting because the more potent a drug is, the more a tendency it will cause addiction. And then that can lead to other problems. And exactly like what you were talking about, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is one of the significant ones, uh, especially when people are using every day, all day long. And uh, psychosis, um, it can, it can worsen depression, it can worsen anxiety, and people think that it's helpful, but what it's really doing, similar to tobacco, is it's, it's augmenting the withdrawal syndrome. Mm -hmm. So when you're addicted to something and you don't have it, you're in withdrawal, and withdrawal to any drug is exactly opposite of what the drug does for you. And so if you feel relaxed when you're smoking marijuana, you're going to be much more tense and much more anxious in withdrawal because of the withdrawal phenomena. And so that makes you have to do it again and again. And so what I think people have to do is, you know, try other skills, other things to manage that, the feelings of stress and anxiety. And those are things that, um, there's lots of things available. Mm -hmm. And we, we do a lot of things in my treatment program and also at the Public Community Health Center where we teach people skills um, and use skills to manage anxiety and stress. Okay. So what, what are some of those things that you use? Well, uh, one of the things I find the most helpful is uh, this simple ear acupuncture protocol. Now, because of uh, physical distancing, we can't really do acupuncture right now, but we can also do acupressure and teach people how to do acupressure. So there's this um, protocol called the NADA protocol. NADA means nothing, <laughs> but it actually stands for uh, National Acupuncture Detoxification Association. And mm -hmm. so this is a protocol that was actually developed 
in the 70s during um, another opiate epidemic that was happening in the Bronx. And so they found out that you could detox people from opiates using ear acupuncture. And so then we've discovered after 9-11 that this same protocol can be helpful utilized for stress and anxiety, trauma, people experiencing severe trauma. And so it's been used a lot around the world um, and we teach people how to do it. Different states have different laws as to who can actually do the acupuncture, but anybody can learn the acupressure. And so it's basically just applying acupressure to different parts of your ear because um, in Chinese medicine, the ear is actually um, a microcosm of your entire body. So you can actually access all parts of your body through your ear. And the acupuncture has been shown in research um, to increase production of chemicals in the brain that are beneficial and also to increase some immunity. So if, you know, if this is something that people can do just to massage parts of their ear where they, they have learned how to do that. And we're coming up with handouts that people can read and look at uh, and learn how to do it. We have videos that are available online that we can share where people can learn how to do this. Other, other techniques that are available, um, or tapping, like and there's a thing called emotion freedom technique. Mm -hmm. People can look that up on the internet. You can actually watch videos to learn how to do it. <clears throat> but it's actually tack tapping on acupressure points. And they all have different meanings. They all do different things for people. Um, and you can learn this protocol. It's actually very calming and relaxing. Um, there's another uh, technique called tapas or it's it's named after a woman who developed it she's um she's also in the internet her name is um tap elizabeth tapas Fleming, and she was is an acupuncturist but came up with this protocol where you actually do uh, you take your ring finger and your thumb and you put it on either side of your nose and your middle finger goes in the center of your forehead and you put your hand behind your head and holding your occipital cortex uh, which is your vision cortex and doing deep breathing. And then she has a protocol where you actually say things while you're holding that position. So people can look that up. I find that very relaxing to help people um, calm down pretty much immediately. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of things that are available out there that, um, and other simple stuff, you know, that people know about like exercise, if you can get outside, social distancing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mask, and walk, just walk, just walk is simple enough or, yeah. um, you know, eating right, getting enough sleep, spending time with your loved ones, um, you know, practicing some things other than thinking about the quick fix. And that's really right. all the drugs are is, is the quick fix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've uh, been a um, kind of an exercise nut most of my life. So uh, uh, that's one thing that, that seems to help me. You know, um, I can tell a big difference, especially when I do a high intensity type of workout uh, first thing in the morning. It, um, you know, the, I get the endorphin rush and, mm -hmm. and it just makes me feel better all over. And it seems like my whole day goes better usually, you know, when I can do that. Sometimes it's just it's difficult to um, maintain that discipline, you know, to get up early and get it done early. Um, but I've found that to be helpful, you know, uh, throughout my life. Um, you mentioned about the, um, the, uh, acupressure reminded me of something. Um, so I do, I have over the course of my lifetime, I've done some, uh, offshore fishing from time to time. And I used to take a little Dramamine, uh, here there because I've never really been seasick I felt a little queasy a few times um, and um, my wife went a time or two she gets motion sickness really easy um, but she found this little wristband that you wear that applies pressure 
um, you know, to the um, carpal area, the you know, inside area of your wrist there, and uh, seems to work at relieving some of the, the motion sickness. Um, does that work in a similar way or? That Absolutely, yes, that's, that's, that's one of the points that they teach people in acupuncture school um, that can relieve nausea. Um, another, another, there's many points that people can push on uh, and, and you don't have to have a license to do that. I mean, you can uh, just push on yourself. Right. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, those are things that people can learn. And I think that there are various um, organizations are now putting out even, I, I saw something from the VA, which was a worksheet on different places you can press on your body for different things like headaches you know different different issues uh -huh. and, and so yeah definitely it, um, it's, it's amazing what chinese medicine knows it's been yeah. around thousands of years uh and it's just i think i really do believe that a great combination is using combining eastern medicine and western medicine do you believe that people who are um using marijuana vaping um, smoking, do you believe they're at a higher risk potentially for um, issues with, their, with the coronavirus? Absolutely. And this is something that needs to get out there. Um, there is more and more research coming out that this is one of the significant risk factors. Uh, and it's vaping, smoking, anything. But of course, most people are vaping or smoking tobacco. And then a larger percentage of people are beginning to vape and smoke marijuana. And, and that puts people at significant risk. Uh, you know, there was a whole thing, even before COVID came out, was the valley or the, the effects on the lungs of vaping, which looks very similar to the effects of COVID on the lungs. Mm -hmm. And so and that it needs to be something that people need to warn people about. And so I, um, I actually think that dispensaries should have this as part of their public service. Um, if they're open and they're selling people products, I think they should be warning people not to smoke or vape the products that they're buying because it puts them at risk. Um, well, it puts them more at risk of being susceptible to the virus. And then once they get the virus, it makes the consequences significantly worse. And th this has been shown pretty much around the, the world right now, where increasing um, deaths are, are more related to people that are smoking. Uh, mm -hmm. In China, they definitely saw that. And that's because men smoke significantly more than women do. Women only like two or three percent of women in China smoke and significantly more like in, above 50 percent of men smoke in China. And and so people will say, oh, well, that's just nicotine. But no, it's smoking. It's, it's putting it because the tar of tobacco is very similar to the tar of marijuana. Mm -hmm. And there's even some evidence that THC can make you more susceptible. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, I think that needs to be a big warning. In fact, I see, I just saw today that finally uh, one of the screening tools that the University of San Francisco, or the medical schooling, I think it's San Francisco, has that on their screening tool for COVID is uh, have you been smoking or vaping marijuana or or tobacco, nicotine products. What kind of uh, preventative measures do you think um, parents can take right now um, to prevent their preteens or teens from experimenting with marijuana and other drugs, like especially right now during this time? Well, I think that the, the biggest thing parents can do is get educated uh, about it. Um, I think there's more and more stuff coming out uh, that parents need to read. Um, uh, there, there's, you know, this, this uh, organization, Parents Supposed to Pot, mm -hmm. um, that has a lot of good literature. Um, the problem, as I see it, is because we legalized it, 
in a way that there was no real regulation, at least in Colorado. It was just like, okay, it's out there and the industry can do whatever they want. And they went around and kind of made everybody think that it was safe and there's nothing wrong with it. While they also at the same time increased the potency of the drug. Most parents don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, and so they, can, they can't really educate their children if they don't think there's anything wrong with it. So I think that we have to get education is the number one thing we can do for prevention. <clears throat> and then you have to have serious talks with your kids about it. Yeah, I would agree with that, that um, most of the parents that I talk to um, are under the impression that marijuana is medicine, that it's not that harmful, and most are not aware of the um, increases in potency um, and what we're seeing now in terms of the, uh, the spikes in um, um, the cannabis-induced psychosis and cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Most are unaware that that's right. going on. Um, so you're right. And I believe we do need uh, more education for parents. Um, so are there any positives? <laughs> what are some <laughs> of the positives that have come out of the, uh, out of the coronavirus uh, issues or the uh, self quarantine uh, that we're doing <laughs> in terms of the, uh, in terms of uh, um, may well just in, in anything really, but especially in terms of uh, uh, the treatment side or recovery side of things. Well, I think there's been lots of positives. I mean, I, I think um, people are spending more time with their family, uh, which I think can be a really positive thing if, if people are all working together. Uh, and I think, you know, getting back to having meals with your whole, all your whole kids, everybody there together, I, it's a great plan. Uh, I think people recognizing how important it is to be able to be out in society and be with people and support each other, that that's a real positive. I think uh, just when you see the pictures of decreased pollution around the world, that's a real positive. Right. Uh, I think also I just saw that there's been decreased car crashes and yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a real positive. So I, you know, I'm hoping that we can take what the positives are and build on them. Yeah. Because I do believe this is going to resolve itself in mm -hmm. a positive way. And I think this is, you know, the other thing that we learned is how important health care is. No, and yeah. how important it is to support our health care and, um, and preventative health. Yeah, definitely. That's for sure. Um, but uh, I appreciate you joining me today. And um, uh, it's been really uh, informative for me. I hope uh, other people out there, I'm sure uh, people are going to get a lot of good things out of this. Uh, conversation. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about before we go? Anything else on your mind um, along these lines? No, I just hope people keep doing what they need to be doing. Staying right. home, taking care of themselves, and let's hope this passes soon. But I think you're doing some really good work, so I well, thank like you. hearing what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you sharing your uh, your uh, insight with me today with the viewers, and um, um, I'm optimistic that we're going to be on the other side of this soon, and um, and that we will learn a lot of good things from it. Thank you so much, Libby. I, I appreciate you joining us today. You're welcome. Okay. All Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.